Welcome to Ink Unleashed, where manga meets microphone, with your host, the Silent Sheepdog. Good day to you, my friend. My name is The Silent Sheepdog, manga author, illustrator, YouTuber, voice actor, and business owner, but you can call me Sheepdog. Welcome to my new independently produced podcast, Ink Unleashed, where manga meets microphone. Here is where I focus on all things manga with a little bit of anime insight, and also where, as a manga creator myself, I share my opinions and ideas. Also expect to hear weekly manga and industry news here on the podcast as well. All right, let's get into it, shall we? It seems Netflix is busy in the anime market this last part of 2023. Scott Pilgrim Takes Off will premiere on Netflix November 17th, 2023 with actors from the 2010 adaptation voicing their respective characters. Castlevania Nocturne recently released with season 1 containing 8 episodes. The original Castlevania anime produced by Netflix was fantastic and I sincerely recommend it. And I will be checking out Nocturne soon for myself. Also, Netflix is pulling another string in the anime market with a new Devil May Cry show. That's super exciting. While I never got to play those games, um, their previous attempt at a Capcom featured title was absolutely stunning and by far one of their best works, so I am very excited for this one and I look forward to watching it. Born on April 8th, 1967, Yasuhiro Naitao is a Japanese manga artist. His likely most known work is Trigun, which was adapted into multiple anime series and films. He has been working on the manga of today's discussion by the name of Kekai Sensen, known as Blood Blockade Battlefront in English, since 2009. Kekai Sensen has also received, as of today, two anime adaptations. He was also the character designer for a series by the name of Gungrave. He attended university, studying social sciences, and then media studies at Hosei University before moving into apartment sales. Naitao Sama eventually made the big move to quit his job to pursue manga illustration full time, landing a spot in Super Jump magazine with a title called Call XXXX. Other works by Naitao Sama include a one shot based on a video game called Samurai Spirits. I discovered Naitao Sama's work on accident as a teenager. It was around maybe 2012, 2013 when I'd stumble across Kekai Sensen the anime. I don't even remember how I found it or where I watched it. I just said, oh. This looks cool, and I dip my toes in. Little did I know that it would become one of my all-time favorite series for the rest of my, so far, life. Whenever the topic of manga or anime comes up in conversation, people always end up asking me, what's your top three, top five, or what's your favorite? While I have many series that could fight to the death over the top spot of favorite, Kekai Sensen always comes straight to mind. In this episode of Ink Unleashed, I'll be covering the first five chapters of Kekai Sensen. Forewarning. Plot point, minor event, and character spoilers ahead. The first page opens up with this hilarious intro, very Naitao-esque. A battle ensues with alien-esque creatures created by a villain by the name of Femt, also known as Femto. Berserk reference? Not sure. Our protagonist Leonardo Watch, with Zap Renfro, a major supporting character, are rescued by the upper-ranking members of Libra. Klaus executes a devastating finishing move. Volume 1, Chapter 0 Here's a note, everyone refers to the setting as Jerusalem's Lot. In the anime, it's referred to as Hail Salem's Lot. This is likely a cultural or localization difference. This chapter is the intro to Leo's story and motivation. We learn via a peek into Leo's written letter to his far-off sister, Michela, that he's moved to the city in order to pursue money to support her. However, we see that though these ambitions are concrete, they are surface level as we learn about the existence of Libra, a secretive and mysterious organization that deals in fighting and hunting threats to mankind. Leo is about his business, enjoying a burger at a local spot he frequents, Diane's Diner. With empty pockets, he's prompted by Vivian, the diner's primary waitress and his good acquaintance, to eat up on a big burger and just wash the dishes later. Suddenly, before Leo can even enjoy a bite, a flash goes by and the camera around Leo's neck disappears. It's been stolen by a sonic monkey, faster than sound. Somebody stop that monkey! Leo makes a mad dash for it. 
His pursuit is interrupted by both being caught up in the chaos of an active bank robbery and being caught by Zap Renfro, a guy who proclaims himself to be a member of Libra. He's looking for a guy named Johnny Landis. And you sure look like him. Did you think you could just skip out on us like that? Leo assumes the identity of Landis in order for Zap to prioritize him and save him. What do you know? It works. Zap then escorts Leo to the hidden headquarters of Libra. Upon arrival, we're reintroduced to the characters from before, and then some. Volume 1, Chapter 1 Klaus von Reinhardt's Leader of Libra Chain Sumeragi Werewolf Special Intelligence and Stealth Femt also makes a reappearance, get used to that, announcing his next and current grand scheme to pulverize humanity into extinction as brutally as possible. A giant monster now known as the Half-God is running rampant, opening portals, i.e. gates, around the city at assigned intervals with random locations looking for its other half, should it reunite with itself. It spells massive dread for the citizens of Earth. The countdown commences. Leo finishes off with some final words in his letter to his sister. How are you, Michela? Your older brother has just gotten himself wound up in something way over his head. Volume 1, Chapter 2 Target Name, Yog Fought Rank, Godlike Type 2 The monster runs rampant, searching for its other half. Klaus is injured in an attempt to shield Leo from an opening gate. Zap and Shane arrive at the scene, accusing this all of being Leo's fault. It happened when he got there. He must be the source of the gates. But Chain deduces this as unlikely, as Klaus took the action to save him. It must be... The monkey! Flashback. We learn that Leo was visiting the outskirts of Jerusalem's lot with his family one peaceful sunny day. Michelle reveals through dialogue why Leo carries a camera around noting that if he wanted to be a professional reporter for the newspaper, he should probably be taking pictures of something other than his sister. Leo narrates that he knew of his father's secret desire for him to go into the city and find a rumored cure for Michelle's condition. At that moment, we witness the turning point of both of their lives. A godlike being appears from the void. It offers Leo and Michelle the eyes of the gods. However, only one may take this illustrious gift. The other must sacrifice their sight. Michela, though already paralyzed and having lived her life in a wheelchair, bravely sacrifices her eyes as Leo stands in stunned silence, unable to protest. Present. The police have arrived on the scene and have Leo, Zap, and Klaus surrounded. In the midst of the chaos, Leo laid his sins and guilt bare before the two Libra members. Klaus offers Leo a deal. Work for Libra? and lend his eyes to the conquest of disarming foes against humanity. And in return, Klaus will offer his knowledge and resources to Leo to find the mysterious truth behind his newly acquired eyes. Klaus then slaughters the police force for killing his plants in the raid. Absolute Chad. Volume 1, Chapter 3 We follow Chain, who is in hot pursuit of the monkey. Zap and Leo aren't far behind. Leo gets a gun. It takes place in America. This was bound to happen. We gotta blow up that monkey! After basically a bloodbath, it all comes to a head when Leo finds that it's not the monkey. It's a flea atop its head? Orchestrating the gates. It all comes to a crashing halt in one frame as Leo crushes the flea betwixt his fingers. Boom. Problem solved. I want to make a note here <laughs> that while I was reading this part, Naitao Sama's art and panel work had me so enraptured that I forgot I was even reading a manga. In my head, I could see and hear all the chaos, uh, the booming, the screaming around Leo before I was jolted back into reality with that final frame. And it genuinely had me laughing because I was leaning into my phone my phone screen super into it before being whiplashed back into reality, but that's one of the aspects I just love about his work. Femt is seen in the panel below, pitching a huge hissy fit about his defeat and how it was going to be so funny to watch the world get annihilated by a flea. Volume 1, Chapter 4 Chapter 4 is a one-shot insert by the name of Kekai Sensel, 
which I have read before, but I will cover that some other time. Volume 1, Chapter 4.5 We get recycled exposition here about the city, curiously now referred to as Hell Salem's Lot. Leo is about his job delivering pizzas and getting a very interesting delivery. This chapter is full of action, and we get to see just how cool Leo's eyes really are. We discover his newfound abilities alongside him in the midst of chaos and life-threatening situations he always seems to get himself wrapped up in. I won't lie, there are some small details that I feel like I missed in this chapter. It does have a considerably good ending, though, typical of Kekai Sensen. Volume 2, Chapter 5.1 Leo's homeless now. Relatable. Offhand, <laughs> I have a deep love and fondness for Leo. He's this millennial Gen Z icon. His struggles outside of being, like, blessed slash cursed with the eyes of the gods are literally just, housing is expensive, I don't make enough money to make make it through even though I work two jobs. I'm single. I love my coworkers, even though they bully me sometimes. <laughs> All jokes aside, Leo truly is a lovable and great character, even with his faults. This chapter concludes with Klaus warning an important figurehead of the human world by the name of Elchenko to not engage in a game of Prosper. I'm not sure how to describe what Prosper is to you, except chess on both crack and steroids? There's two matches. A match between Elchenko and a long-lived deity who grants wishes. Oddly enough, who is a friend of Klaus, and a Klaus, uh, excuse me, a match between Klaus and the deity. Volume 2, Chapter 5.2 Match 1, Elchenko ends. Match 2, Klaus starts. The game goes on to a nauseating extent. This is not a jab at the writing. This is canonically speaking. This chapter ends with a cliffhanger. All right. <laughs> so there's the first five chapters. And as you can tell by my headings, we seem to have skipped some volumes. So the thing about Kekai Sensen is that unfortunately, it's really, really hard to get your hands on the physical copies. I'm talking... The complete selections sell for hundreds of dollars. It was printed by Dark Horse. See what I mean? I just, I love their selection. And so I want to see my works published next to these superstars. But it was taken out of print some time ago. And I was only able to read the manga on an app. Uh, the original Kekai Sensen is sparse for chapters online. Which is a shame. I absolutely adore this manga. And I can see why people don't know it. Uh, as no one ever talks about it, and buying it is quite inaccessible. But I sincerely hope that my episode here today will, at the very least, shine a bit more light on Naitao-sama's works. I will cover Trigon uh, somehow in a future episode. It's also one of my grand favorites, though it has much more of a spot in the spotlight um, and far more content to cover, um, so I'll probably get to it in pieces, most likely. Trigon has a lot of content. However, I think you will love this diamond in the rough, because the manga is hard to come by and sparsely posted online, so I do recommend the anime. I've seen both currently produced seasons like five times each. <laughs> They're genuinely fantastic. Like, the voice acting is top tier, the animation is stunning, and while there are a few story liberties taken in the anime that I don't really think were necessary, um, it's still true enough to the original work to maintain its solidity. Naitao-sama's storytelling is so beautiful and funny and professional and endearing, and I look up to him so much, and I admire him, uh, just like Miyoro-sama. I model many of my works after Naitao-sama, and I like to make both of their influences evident as an homage to my admiration of them. <laughs> he has this talent for storytelling of weird, wacky worlds that even when it's like nonsensical and silly, it just works and you can't help but love it. What truly stands out to me though is his characters. I have not met a character of his that I didn't like or didn't serve a purpose in his stories, no matter how small their role may be or seem. These characters are real, with depth, and they acknowledge the world around themselves in ways that are thought out and with confidence. They acknowledge other characters like real people, and Naitao Sama truly has a heart for his works, and I'm glad he decided to follow through and bless us with his wonderful stories and art. So thank you, Naitao Sama.
I want to use some of our time here today as well to also talk about his artwork and his paneling. Since this is a podcast, unfortunately I can't give visual examples, but I'll describe it to you the best that I can. Naito-sama has a unique art style that's readily identifiable in the way that he draws faces and bodies. His faces are long, their eyes are wide set, and they're striking. Chins are long and pronounced across male and female faces. His hair designs are really cool. His main characters always have that classic spiky-haired anime charm to them. Bodies are really long and exaggerated and square, especially his male characters, and he uses that length to exaggerate and express things in these super dynamic poses that are just like master level. His attention to detail too is genuinely just amazing. He pays attention to things like belts, buckles, knobs, screws, nails, scratches, burns, cuts, scars, the whole shebang. His designs just have so much depth and you can tell that a lot of time care and thought is put into showing you who these characters are before he tells you. And on that note, though, it's quite funny how a lot of times he will design characters outwardly (laughs) who subvert your expectations with their personalities, like as not to judge books by their covers, but also at the same time, like he uses those small details to tell you who this character is. I, maybe I'm sounding a bit silly in the way I say this, but it's, he's really Mm. He has a good enough balance between putting in the right details that tell you who this character really is, but also in a way a lot of their personalities will subvert your expectations. I I suppose that's the best way that I can put it. Um, Finally, I want to talk about his coloring. He seems to really love red. Red is everywhere in his works. Vash's red coat, Leo's auburn hair, Klaus's fiery red hair, the use of blood in Kekai Sensen, and the washed over red tones in his manga covers, and how everything has this muted yet still eye-catching color palette where the focus is either red or it's kind of like this burnt reddish orange, like, it's just, it's beautiful and you just have to see for yourself. So, hey, go read his manga, watch the shows based on his works, and enjoy. I'm sure you will. Alrighty, I hope you enjoy this episode of Ink Unleashed. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you back here next week where I cover a manga that seems to be catching fire in the USA, and at an astounding rate. It's baffling Japanese audiences. So look forward to that, and I'll see you there. Cheap Dog, out.